Thank you for coming. Welcome to the breaking of the fast to close Guantanamo. Sponsored by the National Religious Campaign Against Torture. Um, I'm Reverend Richard Kilmer, the uh, Executive Director of the National Religious Campaign Against Torture. Uh, NearCat, as many of you probably know, was created in January of 2006, about a year after we saw the horrible photographs from Abu Ghraib. And at that point, 150 people gathered, 150 religious leaders gathered at Princeton Theological Seminary and created the organization. We're now in our eighth year. Uh, we had our seventh birthday in, in January. There's more than 320 religious organizations that are engaged in the National Religious Campaign Against Torture. We're really grateful to Senator Dick Durbin, the chair of the Constitution, Civil Rights, and Human Rights Subcommittee of the Judiciary Committee, for holding a hearing today about closing the Guantanamo Bay Detention Center. The hearing will examine the national security, fiscal, and human rights implications of continuing to detain prisoners at Guantanamo indefinitely and will explore how Guantanamo undermines U.S. moral authority, which was a major concern when the, when the National Religious Campaign Against Torture was created uh, in January 2006. In preparation for this hearing, about 200 people of faith across the country have been fasting since yesterday at noon. Photos of some of them are on the program that you uh, received indicating that they are fasting. This fast is a religious act, as it has been for people of faith for millennia. It is also a political act, asking the President and the Congress to close Guantanamo now, which because of the reality of torture and indefinite detention has become an open moral wound. After the service, you're invited to join us for lunch, and then we're going to walk over to the hearing, which will begin at 2 p.m. Let's begin with a prayer, uh, which is on the back of your program. And Leah Koroy, who is an intern at the National Religious Campaign Against Torture, originally from Fiji, will uh, lead us in this prayer. this day to call for the closing of the detention center at Guantanamo Bay. God of justice and mercy, hear our prayer. We pray that as a nation we will work to ensure that torture and cruel, inhumane and degrading treatment never happens again. God of justice and mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for strength for our nation's leaders to act upon the commitment made over four years ago to close the detention center at Guantanamo Bay. Eleven years after the arrival of the first prisoner, Guantanamo remains a dramatic symbol of our nation's violation of our deepest values. It remains an open moral wound. God, justice and mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the spiritual healing that our nation can experience from closing Guantanamo and putting an end to this chapter in our nation's history. God, of justice and mercy, hear our prayer. We lift up in prayer the remaining 166 Guantanamo detainees. Most of detainees in Guantanamo have never been tried, convicted, or even charged with a crime. For years, more than half of them have been imprisoned, despite being cleared for release or transfer. God of justice and mercy, hear our prayer. Many of these detainees in a nonviolent protest of their seemingly permanent detention have been on hunger strike for almost five months. The U.S. government has responded by force feeding more than 40 of the hunger strikers. God of justice and mercy, hear our prayer. We fast to close Guantanamo. We break our fast committing ourselves to ensure the U.S. sponsored torture 
never happens again. God of justice and mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for strength and steadfastness in the work of repairing the world. In all things, may we always honor the dignity and worth of each human being. God of justice and mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. 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 Now we'll hear from the interfaith community. As I mentioned, the National Religious Campaign, the National Religious Campaign Against Torture is made up of more than 320 religious organizations. Uh, we have asked a number of them representing particular faiths to talk to you about why Guantanamo has to close, and that why the President and the Congress should close it as quickly as possible. I will introduce them to you um, and then we'll just say their names and they'll come up and, and make presentations to you. Maggie Sadiqi is the program coordinator for the Office for Interfaith and Community Alliances for the Islamic uh, Society of North America. Sandy Sorensen is the director of the Washington Office for the United Church of Christ. Virginia Farris is the international policy advisor for the Office of International Justice and Peace for the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. Diane Randall, Executive Secretary of the Friends Committee on National Legislation, and we're grateful to FCNL that we can use this building today. Uh, Reverend Amanda Poppy is a Unitarian Universalist Minister. She's the senior leader at the Washington Ethical Society. And Rabbi Charles Feinberg is a rabbi at Addis Israel Congregation here in D.C. Maggie, why don't you start? In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. We're here today as communities who are compelled by our faiths to speak out against injustice wherever we find it. And we stand here as Americans, legally bound by our Constitution to put an end to cruel and unusual punishment. Since 2002, our nation has maintained this prison at Guantanamo Bay. We've heard verified reports about horrible acts of torture, including humiliating acts, solitary confinement, temperature extremes, and use of forced positions. These events have not gone unnoticed by the international community. Where our country was once seen as a beacon of freedom and hope, many now view the United States as an oppressor, as a torturer. And indeed, we are sorrowed that our nation has earned this terrible reputation, because we know that our country can do better. And we, the American people, are far better than the detention center that has come to symbolize us all. Yet 11 years later, there are still 166 detainees, over half of whom have been cleared for release or transfer. Many of them have no charges against them. We have no right to hold these individuals there, and yet they remain separated from their families, their communities, and their livelihoods. We are failing as a nation to provide them with justice. In the Holy Quran, God asks us to be a community that calls for what is good, urges what is right, and forbids what is wrong. Our call today is for justice. We urge the closure of the facility, and we urge our government never to let torture happen again. This is the holy month of Ramadan, um, and so I'll break my fast uh, this evening at sunset, as Muslims are instructed to do, rather than in just a few moments. And Ramadan is a month of stillness and reflection. It's a month of prayer and of remembrance of God. Yet who among us could find stillness in our hearts when our nation of, by, and for the people commits atrocities in our name? And who among us could turn to our Lord and seek His mercy when we show no mercy to the 166 people that we have imprisoned? The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught that among our responsibilities to one another, we should treat everyone with kindness, including those we have imprisoned, and that we should even treat them with hospitality. How can we seek the blessings of God this month, or any other month, while we ignore his clear command? I pray that God grants us forgiveness 
for our wrongdoings as a nation. I pray that he facilitates any effort that might come out of today's Senate hearing that will lead to the immediate closure of Guantanamo. He is the most just and the one who has power over, over all things. And it is only fitting that we seek his help to right the wrongs that we ourselves have committed. I pray that he grants our nation an easy way forward to restore this justice. Thank you. Let me ask, let me ask Diane Randall, who is the Executive Secretary of the Friends Committee on National Legislation. Thank you, Rich. Uh, I want to welcome everyone to the Friends Committee on National Legislation. Uh, my name is Diane Randall. I serve as Executive Secretary. And we're very pleased to be here with the National Religious Campaign Against Torture and our fellow member organizations, um, who faith communities who stand against torture and uh, stand for the closing of Guantanamo Bay. Uh, we are very grateful that Senator Durbin is holding this hearing today as an opportunity to bring to light the concerns, the problems associated with human rights violation, uh, forgetting the rule of law that our country stands for, a chance to, to bring this issue to light and to call on the fellow members of Congress and on this administration to take action immediately to end the travesty that is Guantanamo Bay. I have to say that I've been at FCNL for a couple of years and coming here and working with Intercat has helped open my eyes to see, as well as the opportunity to travel, to see what the implications of our having this um, wound, as we have called it, still festering. Uh, does to us internationally. It does not help us. And there seems to be some sense still that Guantanamo Bay is uh, serving to justify what uh, a payback for what happened at 9-11. And yet, we have people there who have no charges against them. Um, they have not been implicated. And there, we need to disassociate this, and we need to ask our political leaders to stand up for what is right, to follow the rule of law, to be a leader in human rights, not a violator of human rights. And so today we hope that this is what will happen as a result of this hearing. The Friends Committee on National Legislation is a body of Quakers throughout the United States. Our, our vision, as you can see on this wall behind us, is to seek a world free of war and the threat of war. And we seek a society with equity and justice for all. And that's what we're asking for here today, a society with equity and justice for all. We ask that our country be a leader in that kind of society that we seek in the world. And we can do that by closing Guantanamo Bay. Thank you for being here. I regret that I won't be able to stay with you to join the Breaking the Fast, but I uh, look forward to working with many of you in the uh, months to come. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Let me ask uh, Sandy Sorensen. Good afternoon, and thank you for being here this afternoon with us on this important occasion. My name is Sandy Sorensen, and I am the director of the United Church of Christ Washington office. The United Church of Christ has been a strong partner and participant in the National Religious Campaign Against Torture. We have been, for many years now, engaging in um, a number of efforts around grassroots education and mobilizing our United Church of Christ members across the country to act to end torture and the cruel and inhumane treatment of all who are incarcerated around the world, based upon the strong and solid witness of our United Church of Christ General Synod. As an interfaith community of advocates for justice, there is in many ways no other issue on which our vision is so clear our resolve so solid, on which our faith teachings cry out to us with a stronger moral perspective and imperative than the issue of torture. And when the call came out to us to engage in this 24-hour fast and a symbolic witness and a political act to oppose the continuing practices at Guantanamo Detention Facility, I knew that I could say nothing else than yes. The practice of torture the degradation of human beings in body, mind, and spirit runs counter to our calling for a more just, compassionate, and peaceful world that honors all of God's creation. And for that reason, we must counter such practices with every fiber of our bodies, minds, and spirits and point back to what our Creator intends, a world in which all people are treated with dignity and respect. 
Scripture tells us in Genesis that all are created in the image of God and bear that image. Torture violates this teaching at its most fundamental level. To practice torture is to degrade the very image of God. The prisoners being held at Guantanamo have been facing indefinite detention without trial for years. Over half the detainees, or close to half the detainees, have been cleared and yet continue to be held in prison. The loss of dignity and hope that comes with years of such incarceration has led to such a depth of despair that many see no other way than to engage in a hunger strike in a most desperate, desperate protest against their treatment. And in the midst of such a situation, these hunger strikers are denied one of the most basic dimensions of self-determination, the right to control what they take into their bodies through the extremely painful process of force feeding, which involves inserting a tube through the nose into the stomach to administer food. Violence of all kinds is an unending downward spiral. There are countless lessons in history to tell us that. And if we remain silent and allow our government to carry on the practice of torture unchallenged, the end result will be that each of us will lose a part of our humanity as witnesses to such sins. Our souls will bear the wounds that cannot be healed but by the work of justice and reconciliation. Martin Luther King Jr. once observed that modern psychology is very fond of the word maladjusted. He acknowledged the importance of seeking to live well-adjusted lives, but he also observed that there are things to which we should all be maladjusted. Discrimination and the tragic effects of the methods of physical violence and tragic militarism. The practice of torture is something to which we should never become well adjusted. President Obama, you know what is right, and we pray that you will follow through on your stated resolve to close the Guantanamo detention facility. We thank Senator Durbin for holding this hearing this afternoon, and we pray that members of Congress as they sit in this afternoon's hearings on the implications of continuing to detain prisoners at Guantanamo indefinitely, will come to recognize this detention center and the practice of torture for what it is, failed policy and morally unacceptable. The choice is before us, and the time is now. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. I am Virginia Ferris. I'm with the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, and I we have worked very closely with NIRCAT, the National Religious Campaign Against Torture, on a number of um, production production of study guides related to torture as a moral issue. So we're very happy to be able to participate in this event today. Bishop Richard Pates, who is chair of our Committee on International Justice and Peace for the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, wrote a letter to Secretary of Defense Hagel on June 25, expressing concern over the situation of detainees in Guantanamo Bay. And in that letter, he quoted from the Compendium of the Social Doctrine of the Church, which acknowledges the right to defend oneself from terrorism. However, this right cannot be exercised in the absence of moral and legal norms because the struggle against terrorists must be carried out with respect for human rights and for the principles of a state ruled by law. The identification of the guilty party must be duly proven because criminal responsibility is always personal and therefore cannot be extended to the religions nations, or ethnic groups to which the terrorists belong. The compendium further states that the juridical principle by which punishment cannot be inflicted if a crime has not first been proven must be borne in mind. 
likewise ruled out is the use of detention for the sole purpose of trying to obtain significant information for the trial. Moreover, it must be ensured that trials are conducted swiftly. Their excessive length is becoming intolerable for citizens and results in a real injustice. This moral teaching appears applicable to the situation in Guantanamo. Detainees have a right to a just and fair trial held in a timely manner. For at least 86 detainees, a crime has not first been proven. The indefinite detention of detainees is not only injurious to those individuals, it also wounds the moral reputation of our nation, compromises our commitment to the rule of law, and undermines our struggle against terrorism. <coughs> As our Conference of Bishops stated in the wake of the 9-11 attacks, we must, not, we must not only act justly, but be perceived as acting justly if we are to succeed in winning popular support against terrorism. Bishop Pates goes on to ask Secretary Hagel to move expeditiously to release the 86 detainees who have already been cleared and to make good on President Obama's commitment to close this facility that has become a symbol of indefinite detention without trial. Closing Guantanamo will do much to help restore America's moral rep reputation in the world as a defender of human rights. Thank you very much. There are copies of a, a few copies of the bishop's a letter in the back of there, and we likewise join in thanking Senator Durbin for hosting this hearing this afternoon. Thank you, Reverend Amanda Poppy from the uh, Washington Ethical Society. It's an honor to be here today with my co-religionists, with my folks in the interfaith community, and supporting the National Religious Campaign Against Torture. I serve two religious traditions, Unitarian Universalism and Ethical Culture, and both of those traditions have at their heart the important concept of human worth and human dignity, the inviolability of the human spirit. They also... Um, uh, placed great emphasis on human experience as a core element of religious tradition and um, of where we find our ethics and values, our moral compass in the world, and on the com common humanity that we all share, whatever our religious traditions. And both of those movements have taken a strong stand against torture. I want to share with you just briefly some of their words from a Unitarian Universalist Association resolution on torture in 2007. Because one of our core Unitarian Universalist principles is our belief in and affirmation of the inherent worth and dignity of all persons, and whereas torture violates the basic dignity of the human person that all religions hold dear, be it resolved that Unitarian Universalist congregations oppose and speak out against U.S.-sponsored torture wherever and whenever possible. And from ethical culture, the other religious tradition that I serve, from a position paper of the American Ethical Union, the use of torture is the most extreme violation of the principles to which ethical culture is dedicated. Among these principles, respect and reverence for the dignity of the human being is foremost. From the ethical standpoint, torture is the most extreme violation of human dignity because it totally annihilates the freedom and agency of its victims while totalizing the power of the perpetrators of torture. In addition, the relationship of the torturer to his or her victim adds a dimension to torture that is distinctively violative and horrific. What we would say is that torture is a perversion of the, of the basic human need for relationship, that it's a particularly um, it's a particularly horrific act of violence precisely because it perverts that human need for relationship with another. It comes back, I think, to the idea of common humanity so important in both of my religious traditions and I know for many of my interfaith colleagues. You know, policy decisions aside, there is something about our humanness that tells us that torture is wrong. 
we feel it in our gut, that this cannot be, this cannot possibly be the way a human being is supposed to treat another human being. That congregation that I serve, the Washington Ethical Society, has this kind of lofty name. I think sometimes people think we just sit around and think about ethical policies. But the truth is that for most of us, our ethical viewpoints do indeed come or are at least affirmed and confirmed by gut feelings, by moral surety that we as human beings know and name, feelings that are affirmed by so many religious traditions. It's one reason why you see so many traditions here today, because those, those core moral feelings are affirmed by the traditions that we share. And so although we are religious leaders here from different places and different traditions, I think in some ways it is our common humanity, our shared gut feeling as human beings that calls for us to ask for the close of Guantanamo, such a symbol in America of torture. And so I call today on legislators and lawmakers and decision makers to be aware of their common humanity, to listen not just to policy ideas, but to that place in their gut that tells them that torture is wrong, that it cannot possibly be how we as human beings are called to behave, that human dignity deserves better, and that Guantanamo must be closed. Thank you, Nancy. Rabbi Charles Fondler. Good afternoon. In the Jewish tradition and Jewish community, we read the, the five books of Moses in a regular way. Uh, every Saturday morning, we read a selection. And it happens that uh, this Saturday morning, this week, uh, we read a portion uh, that has uh, these words, that you should love the strangers. Uh, there are three commandments to love in the Hebrew Bible. We are supposed to love God uh, with all our heart, soul, and might, and we're supposed to love our neighbors. But we're also commanded to love the stranger. And I believe the reason for this is that uh, it's not so difficult uh, to love our neighbor. We know them. We may uh, understand their idiosyncrasies, uh, even their annoying habits. Uh, and we can muster the, the strength and the courage to love them. It's harder to love God, but even that, I think, is uh, not so is challenging, but something that we can do, and that uh, millions of people do on a regular basis. But loving the stranger, that the Torah comes to teach us because it's easy to love our neighbor, but the stranger who is different, who we do not know, uh, it's so easy to write them off. And the Torah goes out of its way to teach us not to abuse them, not to rip them off. Several times the Torah says that. That is the great danger because these are the most vulnerable people in your community. And yet we as a society, as a country, are now regularly abusing 166 strangers. Uh, who are imprisoned in our prison in Guantanamo. Uh, they, many of them, 86 of them, have been cleared of any wrongdoing and are considered not a threat to this country. And yet, they are strangers and we abuse them on a regular basis. We, as a country, the heart, the essence of our constituted democracy is that we don't take people and throw them in jail and lock them up and throw the keys away. That is an essential principle of constitutional democracy. And yet, that principle now has been tainted. It has been defiled by what we have done to the men in Guantanamo. Because we have locked them up. We have not charged them with any crime. Indeed, we've gone the other way and said they have not committed any crime. And yet, still, we, they, they remain locked up in a way uh, and with no hope at the moment of being free. Uh, the Jewish community is approaching uh, our high holidays in another six, seven weeks. Uh, prior to that, uh, we sound the ram's horn, the shofar, as a sign to people to wake up and to do repentance for the sins that they have committed in the year. Uh, our New Year is a time for reflection of self-judgment and a time of renewal by confronting what we have done wrong and asking forgiveness for those whom we have hurt. Uh, we as a country uh, have a lot uh, uh, to ask forgiveness for. 
uh, especially of these 166 men in Guantanamo. And so in a few moments I will be sounding uh, the shofar, which looks like this, uh, with a long piercing blast. And my hope and prayer today is that the sound of this uh, blast will pierce the inner councils of the White House, uh, even in the President's quarters. That it will pierce the offices of our, of our representatives and senators. That they will hear this blast. Uh, that they will realize what's at stake here, the very principles of our democracy. And that they will do repentance. And they will find a way to release these men. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Benjamin. <clears throat> thanks to all of you for a very helpful, very deep wisdom. The religious community knows very well the power of symbols. Religious symbols motivate people to do good and even courageous acts. Some religions see God in the symbol itself amplifying its power to motivate. But symbols can also be destructive. They can confuse as well as foster dangerous behavior. Because it is a symbol of U.S. torture policies, the detention center at Guantanamo continues to be a profoundly destructive symbol. Guantanamo is a violation of our deepest values. It stands in the minds of millions of people in our nation and around the globe as the place where America broke faith with itself and used torture as an interrogation technique. Torture is immoral, illegal, counterproductive, and never justifiable without exception. It is appropriate that we respond to the political symbol of Guantanamo has become with a religious and political act, fasting. We fast because we want to convince those in charge to do the right thing. We fast because it is a symbol that says, pay attention. It's time to change the policies and choose the right path. In the 58th chapter of Isaiah in the Hebrew scriptures, there's a discussion about the purpose of fasting. Should a person fast to afflict his or her own soul for their own good in order to grow spiritually? Is it to bow down like a bulrush in order to spread out sackcloth and ashes? The author says no by adding, is this not the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free. We fast to let the oppressed go free. We fast to close Guantanamo. It is now time to end the fast. As we do that, we are now committing ourselves to continue our efforts to convince Congress and the President to close Guantanamo. The time has come to heal the moral wound caused by the use of torture and indefinite de detention. The prescription is simple. Remove this shameful legacy and ensure that U.S. sponsored torture never occurs again. We must close Guantanamo now. Our nation's soul requires it. We now break our fast. Invite all of you who wish to uh, join us in this breaking of the of the fast. Let me ask Rabbi Feinberg to play the shofar. Uh, it's for those who like to participate in this, I ask you to stand. I understand if you don't want to.
stand for the benediction. God, we are grateful that you get there first. That wherever there is brokenness, wherever there is injustice, you are there bringing about healing, bringing about wholeness. Guantanamo is broken. Be with us as we leave this place to work hard to say to Congress and to the White House that, that the path is clear. Guantanamo must be closed now. Our nation's soul requires it. Amen. 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 Amen.